hi everybody. So I'm Manu, um, and I'm going to be talking about connected energy. So um, before we start, just a bit of background. Um, I work for First Utility. Um, we're one of the largest um, challenger energy and broadband providers in the UK. Um, I specifically head up the engineering department. So you know we basically. Uh, develop uh, mobile web experiences together with looking after sort of the API or sort of the customer consumer facing API side of our business. So, you know, like Mohammed was talking about, very much customer centric um, design development process. So, we always start with a customer and sort of work backwards. Um, I'm also joined by some of my colleagues um, who have been actually working with the security guys quite heavily. Um, they're probably in more interesting talks downstairs, so um, they've heard all of this before. So I'm just going to really talk about our journey um, towards what we call a connected energy future. And I'm going to focus on um, how our platform has sort of evolved during this time um, with a focus on um, really uh, APIs and identity. So some of it might get a bit geeky, but, you know, that's <laughs> just the way it is. So... This is really uh, our growth journey. So, you know, uh, customer numbers um, on the side and, and just time. So, you know, our growth started really picking up around 2012. We started sort of, you know, um, pushing ahead. And then we sort of grew sort of fairly exponentially, um, established fairly good product market fit. And we are now at just around 800,000 um, sort of active energy customers. So, you know, I'm going to basically talk about how our platform has evolved during this journey and some of the key things we, you know, we came across, the challenges we had to um, obviously address from a business perspective. So the first thing we had to do um, was uh, build an energy switching experience. So this is basically centered around, you know, signing people up uh, and switching their energy to us. So there were, you know, there were quite quite a lot of interesting things we we had to do here, um, you know, from a product management point of view. I suppose we were trying to establish product market fit, and the way we sort of did that really was uh, by offering uh, energy plans at really competitive prices. So we were competing against what we call in the UK the big six energy suppliers, um, and you know, we we managed to you know create a, a product which no one was offering at that time. So this was all great, um, and this is where it starts to get geeky. So from an API point of view, you know, fairly basic at that point. You know, we had quite a monolithic web app. We were a starter. We just had to get stuff done. So the web app was, you know, a monolithic PHP app. Uh, we had a load of front office APIs. So we we have been API driven like from the start. So you know, being, I suppose, coming from a startup culture, we were lucky enough to to be able to do that. Um, the front office APIs were essentially just serving up energy pricing information and allowing our customers to sort of sign up. Um, <coughs> and then we, we had a talk, obviously, about async um, docs and stuff. But, you know, we had a messaging layer, w which uh, we called the event orchestration layer. So this was the thing which processed customer orders. It then spoke to various APIs in our back office. So, you know, we obviously have to uh, bill customers you know, take payments, so all of those sort of relationships were set up in our back office APIs. Um, and for the security geeks, security was pretty much based on API keys. So not that great, but, you know, um, it, it, it started to get better at this point. So as we were growing, you know, um, signing up more customers, we, we really had to think about serving these customers. So, you know, uh, and by this I mean um, giving them some sort of self-serve functionality. Um, and this was the point really where we started introducing users. So we built out, you know, a mobile app, a better web application to allow them to log in, you know, view their bills, submit meter readings. Everything you see here is driven by APIs. You know, the UIs are just obviously a view over everything. So, you know, uh, pretty good. Um, and again, from a platform point of view, you know, this was the, the first time where we really had to think about identity from a user's perspective. So we, we introduced um, LDAP uh, as a credential store, like everybody 
probably did back, back then. Um, it was open source, you know, it didn't cost anything. Uh, we had an API gateway, which um, sort of controlled all um, entry um, into our back of office APIs. <coughs> and essentially, the web and mobile apps would authenticate, you know, pretty standard stuff via the gateway, um, obtain user tokens, and then basically call back into our back office APIs. Um, and this is when we actually moved to OAuth 2. Um, but, you know, very basic. It was more the password uh, grant type at that point. Um, so if, you, if you're interested. Um, and then we moved into energy engagement. So I suppose from a business point of view, you know, um, we were building up quite a sizable customer base at this point, And we had to you know, think about um, retaining customers. So, you know, how do we engage them with energy? And this is where it started to get a bit more interesting. So, you know, we, we, we started to build out more engaging features to, to really, you know, make energy visible. So smart meters, I'm sure most of you have heard of them, quite a big thing in the UK. So we've got a lot of regulation to try and roll these things out. Um, but some of the stuff we were doing, you know, we were trying to make all of this stuff a bit more relevant to users so they could, you know, figure out when they were using energy um, in the day, all of that type of stuff. So really making stuff more visible. Again, driven through APIs. Um, I suppose this is more related to sort of analytics. So we, we also found that, you know, most users actually engaged when um, they, they, their energy was compared to others like them, so similar homes, we, call, we called this. So we built some quite um, advanced analytics models to, to model um, usage and, you know, property types and demographics, number of people in the home, mashed up all the data, build some um, what they call machine learning models um, with APIs over the top so we could, you know, give our users um, uh, usage comparisons. So, you know, in terms of the platform view at this point, very much, um, you know, I suppose this was the time of year, uh, probably the period in time when containers started taking off. So we moved everything to, you know, uh, we started embracing lightweight containers, uh, moving away from uh, virtual machines, um, and I suppose what, what we call microservices today. Uh, so, you know, very, very um, lightweight services focused on one thing. I don't know if you guys have done domain-driven design, you know, I suppose they're very sort of tight little context boundaries around these little, you know, specific domains. So, you know, energy usage, similar homes, they all had um, independently deployable uh, services. Uh, and this worked really well, you know, we, we basically are cadence in terms of we're very, we work in a lean way. Um, you know, we went from previously we were doing Scrum uh, and we were doing a release like every three weeks. And, you know, when we moved to this model and a bit more continuous delivery, we were doing four to five releases per week. Uh, and, and we've increased since then. So, you know, it, it really does work. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> so past sort of January uh, 2016, uh, we entered the broadband market, which was quite um, an interesting thing to do, um, especially from a technol technology point of view. So, you know, from our point of view, this was our sort of second core product. Um, and we've done fairly well here. You know, we've managed to, we're almost up to 50,000 sort of active customers. Um, so it proves that that market can be sort of digitized, even though it's quite boring. Um, it's still a commodity that people need. Uh, so again, you know, we 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 established uh, a form of product market fit, but from a technical platform point of view, um, we had a bit of a problem um, because uh, our sort of concept of identity was very much tied to an energy account, <laughs> and that was a bit of a problem because you know now we were signing up broadband users, so you know how do we support these guys digitally? Uh, so, you know, we had to really think about decoupling the digital identity um, fr from an energy account. So, so we sort of, you know, we did a lot of modeling, got around a drawing board and a whiteboard. And we, you know, we, we decoupled this thing and we started really thinking about future scenarios. And we treated our sort of identity model as more of a, you know, an interconnection of different entities. Uh, all linked to the identity. So, you know, we were thinking about, well, what if we want to model EVs, so ele electric vehicles, you know, battery storage, broadband, energy, renewable power assets, all of this sort of stuff. So we started looking at this problem and we thought, well, actually, from a... Uh, so my background is a computer science and it looked pretty much like a graph data structure. 
Um, so we felt that would be the best way to sort of model model this sort of thing. Um, so so essentially, we 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 chose to model it in a graph database. So we are heavy. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of data stacks. So they support uh, Cassandra. So basically. Uh, they're, they're an enterprise Cassandra offering, and DSE Graph is essentially a distributed graph database. So um, we we then sort of try to model this uh, new domain inside DSE Graph. At this point, we also move to Curity, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but I suppose th this example here sort of uh, really um, uh, reflects how we provision a new identity in this world. So we created what we call a digital management uh, API, uh, digital identity management API. Um, and you know, provisioning users was fairly straightforward. We would sort of add a root node into our graph, which would be their sort of top level digital identity. Um, and then also provision them into the identity provider using Skim. So fairly straightforward. Um, and then we could connect new services. So, you know, if we're provisioning a, a customer for energy, we could connect their identity uh, to an energy service. So this was quite nice. Um, and then, you know, broadband, which was the reason why we were doing this in the first place, it would just be a simple connection. So, you know, th this whole model allows us to now extend out to various things or, you know, new services um, as, we, as we progress. Um, and a couple of things to highlight. So one of the key things is, you know, that I mentioned the digital identity. Um, the thing which stitches everything together is this I digital identifier. So it's obviously getting a little bit technical, but you know, we, we use an identity provider to authenticate mint tokens, all of that type of stuff. The key thing to note here is, you know, once a user authenticates, the, the identity is minted into their token. Um, and we use Curity, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, but Generally, you know, when a call comes into our API gateway, um, the token, having been minted with the digital identity, can be introspected. So it's pretty much an opaque token at this point, but we can introspect it, pull out the identifier, look them up in the graph, and then determine, you know, what um, other sort of services or utilities or entities they've they've got related to their, uh, which are related to their identity. Um, this was also, uh, how am I doing for time? Is it? Uh, Pretty good, seven minutes, okay. So this was the point we, where we also moved to a central IDP, um, and this was a really good move. So, you know, before we were doing most of our authentication into the gateway, um, but this was the point where we started breaking up a lot of our web applications, treat, treating them as, you know, OAuth clients, as opposed to a monolith, you know, talking password grant type straight to a gateway. So, and this has been a really good move, and uh, you know we've been uh, pretty happy with with the results. So, uh, we embraced Open ID Connect at this point. Um, we all of our credentials are stored in um, Aurora, so we're AWS based. Everything is sort of in the cloud, uh, including Curity. Um, so this was all all great. Um, and then you know I mentioned microservices. So this is very much similar to. Uh, the approach uh, the Curity guys sort of covered um, sort of uh, the, during the last few days. So that's all good. Um, and this is really a bit of big up to Curity. So, you know, I think, you know, the, the, this stuff is actually based on us productionizing this thing. So, you know, the, the, this is just the honest view. Um, we chose Curity purely because, you know, it was really great in terms of open standards. So, you know, Open ID Connect, OAuth 2, Skim, really easy to work with. Um, you know, so great protocols and great support. Um, Curity is very, very flexible. So I mentioned, you know, the, the capability to mint custom tokens. We can do that, you know, it allows you to do all of that type of stuff. Introducing new authentication strategies, you know, backing stores. So, you know, we went with um, Amazon Aurora and, and managed to hook that up relatively easily. Um, it can be operationalized, so we, you know, I mentioned we do continuous delivery, so everything can essentially be configured via APIs. So this is great because, you know, when we want to release a new OAuth client, it's simply a matter of running a, you know, a, a build job uh, and basically deploying that straight into Curity. Um, and the other thing is integration hook. So, you know, we wanted to track certain things. So, you know, when a customer activates their digital identity, for instance. 
um, we want to be able to hook into that event through security and write something through to our data uh, systems. So again, you know, the, the hooks and the event listeners which security provides, um, really great. And we've done all of this over Slack, so um, and it's been really good. So we've only met these guys twice, uh, both times at this conference, so which has been really good. So you know, brilliant partnership. Um, so as we look to the future, uh, you know, th this whole sort of new way of thinking about our platform, I suppose, you know, uh, sets us up for what we what we're calling this connected energy future. So you know. We, the energy landscape w will change over the next 10 to 20 years, maybe sooner. Uh, but you know, you can imagine, you know, someone's identity or, or their home, for instance, being connected to various different things. So, you know, electric vehicles, battery storage, appliances, renewable energy assets. And the key thing is, you know, the model I've sort of explained uh, quite easily allows us to start connecting this, and 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 the platform can then start doing some quite interesting thing. So, you know, a good example would be time of use energy tariffs. So, you know, if, if energy is cheaper uh, at an off-peak period, we could maybe charge your battery, you know, as opposed to when there's more demand on the grid, you know, we resort to battery storage and, you know, it, it starts to become a bit more intelligent, everything's connected. Um, and then obviously, you know, having this key digital identity into this world allows, you know, consumers to to use apps to, to, to gain visibility into this thing. So, you know, let's say there's huge demand on the energy grid, you know, basically notify the user and maybe ask them to, you know, start switching off appliances or schedule them to turn on and off at different points in time, you know, when there's less demand. So um, I suppose that's a bit of a, a glimpse in, into the energy future. Am I doing for time? Still got time? Good? Oh, excellent. Cool. And then, so before I finish, um, you know, this is the other sort of thing it sort of opens up. So similar to the city concept, but a bit more neighbourhood based. Um, you know, th this concept of microgrid. So, you know, we're talking about energy changing. Um, we believe there will be less dependence on centralised grids in the future because people are going to be, you know, generating their own energy. Battery storage changes everything. So you can imagine a world where... You know, it's not just your identity which is connected to your home and things within it. It's, you know, connecting to your neighbours and being able to maybe trade energy with your neighbours. Um, and there's a lot of startups already starting to, to, you know, address this space. So using blockchain, for instance, to settle transactions uh, between yourself and, you know, really uh, forming what they call microgrids. So trading energy on the edge of the grid as opposed from, you know, from uh, the centre. And this is going to be a good thing because, you know, we believe um, electric is going to become really the energy future. You know, electric cars, uh, heat pumps will be powered. You know, your heating will typically be electric, you know, in the next maybe 40 years. Um, so this, this world does become um, quite interesting. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. So thanks for listening. <laughs> Cheers.